Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast, others on Facebook and Twitter. Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Collins. Your host, Callie Crossley, has the night off. Tonight, our topic, diversity in golf. In August, Golden State Warrior basketball star Steph Curry made a donation to Howard University to revive their golf program. It got us to thinking about the history of golf, the legacy of the game, who plays, who doesn't play, and it kind of put it all in perspective. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Joining me in a great panel, Keith McDermott of the Three Point Foundation, which supports youth golf programs. Thank you, Morrison, co-producer of the Morrison Golf Classic, an annual African-American golf amateur event on Cape Cod. Dr. Tracy Parker, assistant professor of Afro-American studies at UMass Amherst. And Marcos Ba, founder of the Urban Golf Corps which teaches inner city kids the game of golf. We welcome you all. There's so much to talk about. There's so much to get into. Golf, opportunity, access, cost, Tiger Woods. How come after the Tiger Woods bump that it wasn't sustained and we still are looking for people who look like us on the golf course in numbers? I don't see it. Maybe you see it. Keith, let's start with you. Well, I think, well, first of all, we got to commend uh, Stefan Curry for doing that. Sure. Um, I think the, the big thing is I don't think there was a foundation established to build a feeder system so African Americans could get involved in golf, create access, and teach them the game. So with the barriers that exist or currently exist in golf, you really didn't have those. Those things were not in place. So just having the phenomenon of, of you know, Tiger, exploding on the scene and not having a grassroots to, to create and build that uh, interest and cultivate that. That's why you didn't see much happening there. HBCUs, the golf programs, are a lot of them have gone away. And the ones that are still in existence, they're not uh, made up of strictly people of color. You know, so a lot of times there's international students being recruited to play or Caucasian students being recruited to play, which tells me that the numbers are not where they need to be. When you throw a tournament down on Cape Cod and you get some African Americans golfing, what do you feel? Do you feel like you belong there? <laughs> yeah, I feel like I belong there. Actually, I'll, fun I'll tell a funny story. Um, so this year, uh, my dad asked me to go over to the golf course early, like the day before to drop some things off. I walk into the country club and there's this big group of white folks in the middle of the country club. And you know, I, I, I got that tension thing, like, oh, I hope this doesn't go sideways, right? A few minutes later, they jumped up, and they were like, hey, you're the guys that do the great music. You're here every year. And they came and talked to me. They wanted to take photos. So yeah, I feel very comfortable there. And it's great that we've been able to establish that kind of um, legacy in, in a country club and on the Cape. So yeah. Marcos, I know you've been golfing for about 16 years. You grew up with the sport. Yeah. How unusual was it to see somebody of color, you know, let's say as a 10-year-old, golfing? Well, uh, in the perspective of other players? And your perspective. Of yeah, uh, other, other people, other players of color playing? Right. Not talking staff. We're yeah. talking about people actually out there playing. Well, when I did see it, it was always nice to see. Um, you know, it's, it's not often that, you know, uh, other, you know, white golfers, let's say over the age of 40, uh, see a lot of uh, black kids playing, let alone black adults playing. Uh, so I think it's good for them to kind of see another side of, or even like dead in their perception of what they think a black person is, uh, seeing them on the golf course and actually, you know, me growing up playing with people over 40, um, um, making sure, not making sure of anything, but just playing the game and how, you know, instantly it's, you know, just a matter of, it's, golf demands it. Golf demands respect on the golf course. You're not, I've never been mistreated. Never been, you know, of course you get those, you get those wide-eyed stares sometimes, but you know, they can't, can't help themselves. They they have they have a very closed view of what uh, it means to be black or what black person is, and that's you know usually fed to them through let's say media, uh, internet, movies, TV, whatever. So um, whenever I saw another black person, I was like, oh cool, another brother, cool, nice. Dr. Parker, socially, you know, golf is such a, a social sport. Yes. But when you're not socializing with others that look like you, how do you get past that? How do you break that barrier? Well, I think it's difficult. Historically, African Americans have used the courts to do that. 
Um, it's not, it's very different than other aspects of African Americans struggle to integrate certain spaces and be in those spaces. Um, and so for many of them, what they're doing, at least since the 1940s, have been using the courts to challenge segregation on the golf course. Also, they're also using their own capital to try to create spaces where they do feel welcome, right? So there have been instances where African Americans have tried to create their own golf courses or country clubs. Um, most of them, unfortunately, have failed. There were several businesses where they were tried to have black-owned businesses where they would create their own golf clubs right. and sell them to African Americans. Um, I think historically, and I think this seems to be the the what I'm getting from all of you, is that African Americans are creating a space. And not only creating a space, but making claims to a space. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we are there. You know, if you look at the history of golf, and you mentioned that, you know, trying to get a black-owned course or a black-owned club, if you go back to the history, mm -hmm. the Jewish clubs were founded just because of that, because they were not invited right. as well. Mm -hmm. So you look at some of the private courses, the Kermwoods, mm -hmm. the Spring the, Valley, Spring mm -hmm. Valley the Pine right. Brooks, you know, all beautiful courses mm -hmm. which were Paul Fireman started Willow Bend and yep. built a house on the country club because he couldn't get into the country club. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm getting at for someone who's played a lot of private courses mm -hmm. is always a feeling of, well, do I fit in? You know, do I belong here? And can I, can I, can I, can I live in this space? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I think, you know, going that route and really trying to find your niche or you find your place in there is always difficult, which is a, is a pretty good hurdle. Well, I think my attitude when I play in those courses, especially as an athlete or fundraisers, is just I belong because I can play. I can play with anybody. Right. Right. Not with Tiger, but I can play with I can play sure. with anybody at the golf course, probably even better. So, you know, but I think for us is the lack of familiarity. That's that's a, that's not a space that we're used to being in. So. For, for that, we, you know, we need to take the, the game doesn't change that much. Right. The greens are more pristine, the fairways are a little bit more pristine, but it's still the same swing, and you still got to play your game and not be intimidated by that. So you just got to, from the mental standpoint, that you do belong there. And so, Should we be encouraging more Steph Curry's to, you know, to, to take this, you know, because obviously there's a lot of athletes, yeah. black athletes who play the game of golf, who love the game of golf and play it very well. And yeah. I think really if you start with not Tiger Woods, but you know what Michael Jordan's passion, mm -hmm. you know, outside of basketball certainly was golf. Yeah. Should we be pushing other athletes, you know, when you talk about the fields, the football stars, the basketball stars, to help fund these type of programs? I think it's happening. Um, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett just did a deal with Top Golf. Yep. Um, so that's a national uh, driving range chain for those folks who don't know. Um, super popular. Yeah, super popular. And so there's some other things happening. There's uh, Wendell Haskins. He's got a golf tournament in the New York area. He's got lots of celebrities that come through, um, lots of top name celebrities. So I feel like it's happening organically. They, you know, big name people are getting involved in, in this push. And people have been involved in it for a long time. Like I said, my golf tournament, my parents' golf tournament, has been 19 years. This was year 19. Right. So people have been involved for a long time. The Wendell Haskins Golf Tournament has been about 18 years. And there's people who started there playing golf who are now bringing their kids to play golf. And so I think as those people get older and the sphere of influence grows, and then more celebrities get involved because of that sphere of influence. Anytime you talk about minorities or people of color in golf, obviously Tiger comes up. Right. Has he done enough to foster this? It, it's not his job. It wasn't his job. His job was to win, and that's exactly what he did for 15 well, years. I didn't ask for his job. I asked, has he done enough? He did, he, it was, it's, not his, it's not his responsibility to bring black kids to play golf. It wasn't. He what? never made it because he, he never even identified as black to begin with. So he's half Asian, first of all, and he's like, a, I wouldn't even say a quarter black. His father's white, Indian, and black he's not and he's, well, and he's certainly someone of color yeah he's, he's somebody certainly yeah, identified sure. as someone of color and he's identified 10 times or at least 10 times mm -hmm. on a white golf course mm -hmm. at a country club as someone of color mm -hmm. yeah and I can give you a quick story on that you know and I've had I've had some experiences at private clubs mm -hmm. and 95% yeah. of them been positive and I think a lot of that is because there is a familiarity because I've been on television right. in this market for so yeah. long mm -hmm. but I remember being at a country club up in the up in the Merrimack Valley where the 
a guy driving a utility cart yeah. came all the way across the course and stopped and said, I thought it was Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the member who was hosting me was, as you can imagine, yeah. a white guy, but yeah. horrified. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, again, you, even if he doesn't identify with being black, he's, he's, he's looked at yeah. it as someone. So no, yeah, Chris, but it was that because of your long drive that you hit? Or was it was yeah. nothing to do with it. I didn't even hit it. I was just standing <laughs> on the tee box, <laughs> minding my um, own business. That was a layup, but, man. You should have taken that one. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, yeah. um, you know, it was, it was, it's, he was too busy winning. I don't expect, like he did at first, um, when he first started his t uh, Tiger Woods Foundation. Yeah, he went around to, he went around and did clinics for kids for the longest time. But, um, you know, over, you know, maybe doing that for a couple of years, he realized, um, along with his father, that, you know, they needed something more tangible. So that's why they started one of the greatest, you know, scholarship programs that helps inner city kids get into college and pay for college, you know, all over the world. So it's like, um, did he do enough to get black kids to play golf? No, but I mean, was it his, but did he do great things otherwise? Yeah, but was it his job in the first place? To get because because he's black by association, like I don't feel like he had the. Well, I think when we look back, maybe not at Tiger Woods, but we've looked at some earlier first in the golf field. What they have done is they've brought people with them, um, and so it's funny. I was reading a story. I think it was Charles Shippen who said that he started as a caddy, right? And there's something about that work of being a caddy, which I think currently we would say that it feels somewhat degrading. Sure. Um, and we used to uh, be represented highly in, as, the, in the space yeah, of caddies. Absolutely. And you know why we're not anymore. That's because of it's golf money, courts and money. money. The caddies started right. making money. That's right. And then they pushed That's exactly people right. of Colorado. Well, but there was an attempt by many black golfers historically to have a black caddy to bring them along to train them in the f sport of golf, but also that's where a lot of caddies learn to love the sport of golf. Mm -hmm. um, and they were passing it down that way. And we're talking about African-American golfers who don't come from the same socioeconomic background as Tiger right. Woods. We're talking about many of them who are working class, urban, African-American men and women. Yeah, I think that you know the history of a black golfer would be directly correlated to caddies yes. and they, they played when they had opportunities to play those right. courses yeah. and played very well. My father was a caddy and so he grew up being a caddy, learned golf and then I grew up playing golf with my dad mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that was unusual until much later in life mm -hmm. but every Saturday morning we were out at the golf course mm -hmm. much to my chagrin because yeah. we were on Saturday morning I wasn't watching cartoons yeah. but I didn't realize that was unusual until yeah. much later in life sure. yeah. but that's, that was my early experience. Last weekend there was a historic game and I'm going to call it historic Howard University came and played Harvard football team. Dr. Wayne Fredericks was around watching the football game. We had a chance to catch up with him and talk to him about the big donation that Steph Curry made and what it means not to just golf, but to character of his student body. Steph Curry's gift uh, is more than just about supporting golf. It is about supporting the opportunity for African Americans to be educated um, at Howard University. It's also about exposing the entire university community to a game that I think really has some values embedded in it that are very useful in the overall development, the holistic development um, of a student. Um, with golf, there's a lot of integrity, there's a lot of respect, uh, patience, uh, in some circumstances, teamwork. And so all of those are values that uh, we cherish and that we're trying to uh, infuse in our students and having them exposed to golf, whether they play collegiately, competitively, but having a team is certainly going to expose more people to the game and hopefully bring more of the student population as well to the game. So the donation was to the golf team, but the president of the university over at Howard believes that it's much bigger than that. Would you mm -hmm. concur, Marcos? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, with my company, Urban Golf Club, um, I have three core values, patience, accountability, and humility, which is all learned through the game one way or another. You can't, you can't, you can't run away from it. And um, when it comes to our inner city kids today, um, I, it's almost, it's almost non-existent for in some, in a lot of cases, um, that those three values, patience, humility, and accountability. And if I can, you know, introduce these kids, even one kid at a time to this game and have them, you know, kind of, whether it's changing their lives or even give them a wi wider world view or wider, 
view of how they should, you know, uh, act as a person with, you know, good character, then uh, I think uh, that's exactly what uh, my job is. Both my girls golf, you know, 9 and 11. They both get out there in the spring. They both, you know, I think I teach them those values. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the bigger thing is, but I play golf, you know, is getting the buy-in from parents who don't necessarily have played. I mean, I didn't play for my entire childhood. I may have picked it up 10 years ago, and I grew up in a town where, you know, it was a top 10 course, Salem Country Club, is in Peabody, where I grew up, but had never even, not had thought about playing golf, but, you know, I grew up with, you know, Jim Rice, who played tons of golf, and the rumor was that Jim Rice wanted to play at Salem, but was not allowed to play at Salem. So if Jim Rice couldn't play at Salem, then right. really, who could play at Salem, right? right? Yeah. So how do we get the buy-in from the adults? Well, I would say as a university professor, part of this is about professional development, right? So we, I think someone did a study several years ago where they found that executives spend approximately 32 hours on the golf course. So in that 32 hours, this isn't simply just a form of leisure. This is a workplace. These are where people are, you know, they're making deals. And if you want to be part of that upper echelon, right, mm -hmm. some of that, you have to sort of partake in some of those activities. And so to some, to some degree, golf is about, it is a symbol of upward mobility. Well, and, and I also think that, you know, first of all, I think that athletes should do more. Yeah. Okay? You, you, you don't necessarily have to be a golfer to bring people to the game. You can do more to support the game and support the kids that are, you know, introduce them to the game, cultivate it, and help them maintain it. Um, take, for example, as a young man at Franklin Park, Pitt, I mean, Nate Daly. He mm -hmm. started when he was two years old, three years old. He's 14 years old now. Hits the ball 300 yards with his three wood. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the kid is excellent. Probably never had an informal lesson. Sure. Athletes need to support organization, nonprofit like that, that bring kids in, teach them, get them on the amateur circuit, so they can be in a pipeline. Because what you're going to have is when you get to a Howard, a Howard University, if they have a golf program, if there's no pipeline for them, then you know, guess what? they're going to start going overseas right. to get golfers. And so the reason that you haven't seen the, the you know, expansion, explosion of, uh, unlike tennis, where Venus and Serena Williams went back to community and created and supported nonprofit to teach to get the game and of that tennis. took a special situation exactly. where their father was really you know, on the courts yes. in the yeah. inner city and really driving that. Exactly, That's yeah. But you need to have that in, in golf where you can cultivate those things. And you can get these kids on the circuit, and you can support programs. This summer, we had some kids that um, collaborated the First Tee program in Franklin Park and brought some kids over there. And you know, when I saw those kids this summer, yeah. I mean, I was very hopeful, and the future looked promising right. for us because those kids are awesome. Their behavior, their language. I mean, there's some of the kids there that, that go to school in Boston that some of the teachers that we hired, um, Three Point Foundation hired kids or teachers from Boston Public School System. This kid was here before, you know, just his language and his, his demeanor, and they got attracted to golf, they got hooked to the, the sport, and, you know, just buying them a set of golf um, gloves and um, some clubs and some balls, that they, they got hooked a little bit. So hopefully they need to be programmed to make sure that continues and, and, and go on. And if you don't have that, then, you're not going to have anything at the back end of the uh, Have you seen growth, Sekou? Yeah, have you I was seen just about growth to, as you? Yeah. yeah, I was just about to piggyback on that. Uh, and this harkens back to something Keith said earlier about exposure. So at our golf tournament, there's been a little bit of growth in terms of golf players, but it kind of hovers around 40 to 60, right? Mm -hmm. But the white party, because black folks love a white party, we have a white party after the golf, and that has grown substantially. Mm -hmm. And we also have added a putting clinic during the white party. So we expose folks who just come to mm -hmm. kick it to golf. Right. Mm -hmm. And those people have really, have really glommed onto the game. Some of those people have gone and bought clubs. Mm -hmm. They come back to play the next year. Mm -hmm. So it's about having the access and exposure and having someone say, hey, this is how you do it. This is how you do it right. And feeling comfortable there um, amongst their peers. Mm -hmm. Tracy, back to what you said, you know, that, that, that access of, of doing business, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, of mm -hmm. putting deals together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I play enough golf, yeah. and right. I, I don't do a ton of business on the golf course, mm -hmm. 
but I do a ton of business of people who I play golf That's with. That's right. Because you break down barriers. Well, you, you're with someone for four yeah. and a half hours. That's right. exactly You right. find out a lot about somebody, mm -hmm. and there's a comfort level yeah. right. that Absolutely. you get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's really what kind of has driven me to push my kids out there. My kids right. are unusual because they went through first tee, right. yep. but they also yep. belong to a couple country clubs. Mm -hmm. So they've seen yeah. the front door and the back door, right. and they've yeah. seen everything. Mm -hmm. So I just think the dynamic right. of yeah. anyone of color who's playing golf, mm -hmm. and even Franklin Park, where you will see, obviously, people of color playing, right. yeah. but you still see a lot of Caucasians out yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and yeah. you're still driving to, to yeah. get more of people who look like myself out there playing. No, no yeah. for sure. And... Um, I think it's more. It's, it's, I don't think this is so much a race, uh, a race conversation than a culture conversation. Um, you know, white, white. You know, back when we, it was four hundred year old sport. Um, you know, people from Scotland put something together because they were bored. So, like uh, throughout the years, it's always been whitely white dominated. And you know, um, back in the day, you know, PGA had the PGA Tour had their own clause where you know if you weren't white, if you weren't yeah, if you weren't white, then you couldn't play. That's right. Um, uh, you know, and that went on, and that kind of set the stage um, for a few for even decades. And um, just very recently, Augusta finally you know right. brought in women mm -hmm. and yeah. those of color. No, exactly. The Condoleezza Rice's, and the, the Lynn Swans. That's right. That's very new. Yes, um, and you know, back in let's say the '70s, there was Lee Elder. Uh, Charlie Sifford, there was Calvin P. As players. As but players. Certainly as play not as members. As players on the PGA Tour. Okay. Um, you know, you know, while they kind of like set aside or even after the likes of, let's say, Teddy Rhodes, which people do not know at all, right. which he was a phenomenal golfer, or even before then, um, the first uh, black player to play in the U.S. Open was in 1895 or 1897, uh, and his name is John Shippen out of... Shinnecock Hills, which he and he was a caddy uh, to begin with. Um, so there's always there's always been black representation, of course, not in the masses that we like, but that's just a matter of culture because, you know, uh, who's introducing these kids to the game? Who's, into, who's introducing these white kids to the game? It's their fathers. Of course. That Most, goes back I, to exposure and right. cultivation. Yeah, but, exactly. it, but, I, but I would disagree with you. I don't think this is simply about culture. This is about race. So going back to the 18th century, slaves are the ones who are building golf courses. They're designing golf courses. Sure. They're the caddies. Even then, after during emancipation, they continue in these similar roles. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why these spaces remain all white, right? These are spaces that have historically remained white mm -hmm. because they are symbols of capitalism and imperialism. And they are the ultimate symbols, historically, of whiteness. Now, I think since the mid-20th century, there have been efforts by African Americans to sort of break that down uh -huh. and change that culture and change that environment. Yeah. But there is... The fact that you could talk about a country club, a private country club, with sometimes rules that are unclear as to how you can become a member. I mean, these are done specifically to keep certain people in and certain, certain people out. Yeah, I mean, it's about, it's about with, with these private clubs, it's about who you know, first and foremost. Um, you know, you could... So then it becomes about your circle that you... No, exactly, that you with, what you with. mingle with. So it's like, you know, they're, they're, I mean, there are black members at private clubs all over the country. Um, of course, not in. Of course, you know the ratio is, is you know like maybe one for every thousand. Well, I one for every three, thousand. and I can count on, well, maybe one hand. Yeah, Those exactly. Total. No, uh, same here yeah. at the club. I uh, yeah, at total. the country club where I caddy. Um, but uh, like I said, I think it is a cultural thing because you know you have these kids who aren't exposed to the games in the inner cities because they don't have anybody to expose it to, um, to expose them to it. And you know these kids, these white kids that are that grow up playing golf, and their fathers who grew up playing golf, they were taught by their fathers, and it's a generational thing from generation to generation, father passing down to the son. Sure. And you grandfathers. Know, yeah, exactly. And then they're doing business together. Right. And and, right. and, and the kids end up, you know, marrying one another That's and right. they end up right. saying right. yeah. playing That's the same right. pool and, together. And, and um, you know what? What a big thing that's that's lacking in the black community is, is, let alone fathers who play golf, but fathers in general. Well, that'd be well, a different, different conversation. Yeah, yeah I know, but it, but it's, but it's, I'm saying it's a factor. Yeah, I'm not saying it's any re it's any main reason, but it is a factor that you know you don't see a lot of kids because it's not, it's you know golf is very family oriented. In you know the South, there's plenty of black golfers. The, you know the 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 um, the Georgia State golf team 
uh, for high school was an all-black team, and they won the championship. Yeah, it was the first public team to yeah. win a state championship, yeah. and that was also the first all-black team. And that's obviously very, very atypical, as that was a charter school, which is an African-American charter yeah. school. And obviously there was somebody, a catalyst, who had a passion for that's golf. Right. So yes. the, the progress is there. I mean, we're, we're, making, we're making tremendous strides, especially with Steph Curry um, getting involved and things like that. And, you know, people like, people like Chris Paul plays, people like... Uh, Andre Godal Well, that's where I would say. I would say that there's no shortage of people that we know, recognizable yeah. people, playing the game, but I don't think we support the game right. enough. Because it's not a part of our culture. And it goes yeah. back to exposure, cultivation, and access. No right? question. That's exactly Most right. of those guys yeah. did not start playing until they that's later. Right. You're right. When until they, they became when I'm a superstar. They, they let me get you yeah. in no there. Why don't you come on uh, down so I can say, a club member say, let me show you that playing. Right. So it goes back to exposure, cultivation, right. access. All right. Appreciate it. Appreciate everybody coming. We're not quite done yet. That's going to wrap up our broadcast portion of the show. Thanks to all of our guests. Thanks to you for joining us. Please continue the conversation. Stays right there on Facebook and Twitter. Stay right there. We're not going anywhere. Came to the game late in life. I started playing in my 30s. Uh, my son started playing when he was three. He has a significant advantage. You know, he plays well, but more importantly, he learned a lot of the rules of the game, the courtesy associated with it. And there's a lot that you can tell about someone when you play golf with them. Um, I played four and a half hours of golf with Steph Curry after we made the announcement, as an example. And, you know, you can tell how courteous someone is, which he, he was. You could tell how respectful they are in terms of being willing to wait for others to play. I mean, all of those are things that you can quickly get from someone that in, in a four and a half hour period that you wouldn't traditionally get in most boardroom settings. That was Howard University President Dr. Wayne Frederick in town for the Harvard Howard football game last weekend. Talking about Steph Curry and what he was able to do as far as the big donation to the golf program at Howard University. Our conversation continues on Facebook Live and Twitter with our panel as we talk about diversity in golf. And I know, Keith, you were very passionate about your entry into golf and what you know, you've kind of done to get to where you are and some of these courses that you've played and how you kind of fit in. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, again, like I was talking about, it's, you know, a lot of us got involved in golf at a later age, not through the fundamentals, changes, and my, you know, initial... Invites, I turned out a lot of initial invites. No, I don't want to go, I don't sure. want to go, I don't play. But then once I started playing, you know, it was, okay, now if, some, if I had been introduced to this at a young age, where could I have been? Not being a pro golfer, but I would have been all those invitations that I turned down. And I didn't want anyone to feel that way again. So that was my premise for really starting to look at Urban Golf Academy. Let's introduce the kids so when someone mentioned golf to them, it's not foreign to them. And, you know, let's, after you do that, the exposure, let's create, uh, cultivate it, let's teach them how to do it, then let's create access. How can we create access for them? What is a public course? If you learn to play the public course versus a private course, you know, you still have the fundamentals, though. so those skills are transferable to a private course. So, you know, the other social soft skills that goes along with playing golf, you know, you can pick up later on, but those things ought to be really committed to creating at a level where it's involved in a curriculum or in a training, a nonprofit, or it needs to be an organized approach to doing that sure. for kids. Dr. Parker, how do we increase access? Oh, that's a big question. I'm, you know. That's why I gave it to I you. I <laughs> know. <laughs> Dr. Doc, no right? Because when we exactly. look, at least in the past, I don't know, 50 years, African Americans who were able to play on public courses, mm -hmm. a lot of those public courses were actually closed down because there was a decision. There was fear by white people that they didn't want to integrate. 
Um, and so it's a difficult, I think that question is interesting because I think we get into larger questions about urban space and the type of control and access African Americans then have to the, the places in which they work and they live. Um, so I, I'm, I'll keep thinking about it, yeah. but yeah. yeah right, right. <laughs> but I could add something to that without, at the risk of dominant conversation, is that Boston has two, two private courses. Yeah. The state has some public golf courses. Franklin Park, George exactly. Wright. Leo J. Martin and, and Ponca Park. Those courses, we have to start working with the mayors and the governors to allow them to allow access for youth programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for young kids, if you're part of a program, sponsored program, you get two hours of tea time book on a weekly basis mm -hmm. that you can go in and play. Um, organization could always get golf clubs donated and golf balls donated. Okay, but we, as that's where the athletes come in or business people like us can support nonprofit to really cultivate and support those programs. The young man I talked about, Nate, you know, you got to get on a, an amateur circuit. Let's see how we can support that, those kind of programs, those kind of a kids that where they can, you know, there's a way to support the entry fee and their travel and right. their hotel mm -hmm. so they can then get exposed to that. And they may not be pro, but they could really. Sure. But the access for kids are really important. Yeah. It's funny that you say that because I was thinking back mm -hmm. to my high school curriculum and there mm -hmm. was a unit in gym that we all had to do in golf. Right. Yeah. I mean, and so... Mm -hmm. That has certainly been phased out. And I right. think that if these are those moments, you're right, that if we give children moments where they can at least start to engage it mm -hmm. um, and see it as something tangible and something that could become something greater, yeah. right? That you're not going to become the biggest football player, right? You're right. not going to become, I don't know, um, Ray Lewis, but you're going that you can do something with this. Sure. It's important to your maturity and your mobility and yeah. There's, there's a lot of groups, you yeah. know, around mm -hmm. the country that, you know, support minorities playing golf. You know, your your organization is a is a great one as far as, you know, trying to build momentum. How do you get that to the next level? I know you've been at it twenty years now. How do you get it to the next level okay. where, you know, you don't have forty, let's say you have eighty or you have hundred and twenty. So just to be clear, my parents have been at it yeah, <laughs> for right. 19 years. Yeah. Uh, I used to just carry ice. It's in your <laughs> but, but, it's, but now I've gotten more involved. Yeah. And we're in the, we're in the, representing the it's set. It's in your DNA. A minute, yeah. a minute. Yeah. Uh, and there's some talk about me taking it over. Uh, so I think what's been helpful for me coming into it kind of fresh, like I started off playing golf, as I said, then I went away from it and came back as a part of the Marston Golf Classic. What's been helpful for me is the use of social media, like mm -hmm. all the, the, the tools of social media has helped me not only expand the circle of the Marston Golf Classic, but also learn more about what's already happening in the black space and golf. Mm -hmm. like I learned about the um, long drive competition uh, with Troy Mullins, like this all about hitting yeah. the ball as far as you can. Sure. Like I, I had no idea that even existed, oh, but yeah. for social media. Yeah. And so I think that's helpful. And also with our tournament and even to a greater extent, the one I mentioned before, Wendell Hawkins event, um, you have to make it cool. Yeah. Like you got to give it some swag. Yeah. You got to give it some appeal. And then, mm -hmm. then the younger folks see that, oh, there's people like me that are playing and people that, that I think are cool are playing. Mm -hmm. And so that's been pretty helpful too, trying to get some, sure. some bigger name people to our golf tournament mm -hmm. and supporting. I mean, see, that's where I like, think we've, we've missed it as people mm -hmm. of color that, Absolutely. that we haven't, you know, the, the, the Steph Curry's haven't been out there saying, listen, you know, this is my second yeah. love. Right. Yeah. You know, this is, yeah. uh -huh. this, is, this is a real good thing to be doing. Right. You should yeah. get on board mm -hmm. and try this out. And I don't think we've done enough of that. Because, yeah. you know, I, nobody plays as uh, many tournaments as I do. <laughs> and there's significant people out there. And I think if kids saw that, like right. I see yeah. that, right. mm -hmm. yeah. there would be more of an attachment. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, no doubt. And you um, talking about access. Um, I've, you know, I've, I, uh, I've um, been around about, maybe seven community centers now. Okay. Touch, I've touched about seven community centers now. And um, What's the response? The response is, well, first and foremost, I mean, I don't get them just like, I don't give them a mat and a ball and a club and just have them like hit and just see what happens. You know, I, I play games with the kids. I kind of make up these, a lot of these games I make up on the spot where they just do obstacle courses and relay races of just hitting a tennis ball down the down the court or something like that. And I did this all throughout the, the winter. And um, I brought a, I, brought in a, uh, a group of kids from the Blue Hills uh, Boys and Girls Club to Franklin Park. Um, Franklin Park has always been um, good to me. I've, I've volunteered in their 
first team program for a number of years. And, um, you know, just bringing them out there. And, they, you know, just, I just let them run loose. I just let them run around. Um, I couldn't really get them to play or anything like that because we had, you know, just an hour. But, um, you know, I had them, you know, see what's, what's going on. I played, I played the 12th hole for them. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a good experience for them. And I think, you know, there's more of that to come for sure out of uh, my program. It's just a matter of um, doing more and asking more clubs to uh, allow it, which, you know, they're pretty responsive. Are they open to it? Oh, yeah, 100%. Even um, the place where I caddy. You know, I've um, trying to get kids on the course for the week of the U.S. Open at the Country Club in 2022, and um, you know, so far for when I've brought it up to um, you know administrators there, they, you know, they're they're all for it. I've been a caddy there for a long time; and they know me pretty well. So, um, yeah, it's it's. I think it's going to be great for the future. I think it's going to be great in the future. Black golf, black kids playing golf. It's, you know, it's just a matter of time. Great. Final thoughts. Well, I think you got to put some uh, f fundamentals, foundation in place to make sure it's got to be systemic. It's got to be strategic about how to get kids. So it comes from the exposure, introduction, and build and build it throughout. So they can, you know, it's got to be strategic. It can't. It's sure. not going to happen just, uh, you know, just happen like that. It's a. It's an interesting space. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's 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 really an interesting space. I. I I covered Tiger Woods' first professional tournament in 97 mm -hmm. as I was a sports reporter in Milwaukee, and he turned pro at the Greater Milwaukee Open. Mm -hmm. And golf that day, you know, with the whole hello world, yeah. I mean, it, it changed oh, yeah, because there wasn't anybody even remotely close right. to being of color on those courses prior to him showing up. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe way in the back in the kitchen. Right. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, now yeah. you actually see, right. you know, black people golfing just we don't see it the way I think. Yeah, we absolutely. would have seen it, you know, 20 years later after he turned yeah. professionally. And like you said earlier about people saying this, this is my second love, that conversation, those conversations are happening, but they're happening within the community, within the golfing community. Mm -hmm. So what we got to do is get that conversation out of that golfing community so other people can hear it. The yeah. people who haven't been exposed to the game of golf can hear it and say, oh, wow, Steph Curry's into that? Right. Oh, maybe mm -hmm. I'll check it out. So we've got to expand the conversation. And, and for me, that's what I've been using social media for. Yeah. Appreciate it. Seku, Marcos, Dr. Parker, Keith. Pleasure. The conversation's been lively. It's been entertaining. And it's a love of mine, you know. Oh, thank you. Someone of color playing golf. Yeah. You know? All right. All right. That's going to wrap it up for Facebook Live and Twitter portion of the show. You have yourself a great night. We'll see you back here on Basic Black real soon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.